I titled the study tonight in chapter 2, The Crucified Life. You know, as Paul mentioned in chapter 1, that really the answer to divisions in the church, and for that matter, for any problems that could materialize and take place in the church, is getting back to the essentials, getting back to the simplicity and the truth. And here, as Paul describes it, he makes it very simple. Here is the answer to the issue in chapter 1. For God did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of no effect. The emphasis added in verse 18 is this, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In this confused circumstance that the believers at Corinth find themselves in, Paul then is coming with words of correction. Because remember in verse 11 of chapter 1, he says very clearly that, that it has been brought to his attention, declared to him for that matter, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions or divisions among the believers the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24 that leaders must not quarrel. But it seemed that there was quite a bit and various factions have divided within the church, some following certain leaders and others following certain men. And for various reasons, it didn't matter what group you were following, ultimately, Paul kind of settles it with verse 13 of chapter 1 when he says, Is Christ divided? The problem that plagued, I believe, the Corinthian church because they were a very wealthy church and rich not only in material things, but they were also rich in spiritual gifts. It was pride. Pride got in the way of the simplicity of what brought them to faith in Christ Jesus. It wasn't riches or wealth or the prestige of the city of Corinth, but it was a simple work of the Holy Spirit it got them to understand and realize that they were sinners in need of a Savior. Something their money, their positions, their title, their prestige could not buy them. It was simply a work that they had no involvement in at all whatsoever. It was clearly the work of Jesus Christ, the message of the cross. Paul then appeals to them on another note as he just says, listen, it's not about the wisdom of the world. It's about the simple preaching of the gospel. And he closes out chapter one with this idea and he's saying, listen, not even the best of scholars nor the best of philosophers can bring someone to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But I love what he says in verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks' foolishness. I want us to draw our attention a little bit on what Paul is saying in regards to the crucifixion of Christ and what it is to live the crucified life and what it looks like. Some people will go great lengths to prove that they are followers of Jesus. Some even do very simple things like putting T-shirts on and they got their cute little Jesus shirts. You guys know what I'm talking about. Don't get religious on me tonight. Your cute little bumper stickers, not of this world. I get all that, and that's cool. People will see that. But that's not living the crucified life. The crucified life is truly understanding the price that was paid so that you and I can have a relationship with the holy, righteous God. It's first understanding your position as a man or a woman, a person who is truly a sinner in need of a Savior, and those very things that separate you from God. Because initially we are separated from God. There is nothing you and I can do by the work of our own hands that in any way could make us right with God. It's simply all what Jesus has done and understanding that, that there's nothing else. And perhaps maybe in the pride of this division, they forgot how they first came to faith. It's interesting that in the couple of verses there in chapter one, as Paul begins to say, some are declaring this and others are declaring that, that perhaps they forgot what it was like when they realized they were sinners in need of a savior. Like the day that they had problems and nobody was there to help. That even if they did have resources and wealth, that that couldn't help them. 
The moment they heard the gospel message, it changed everything that present moment and brought them to a place and realized, well, if this God is real, and if he truly did send his son to set me free from the bondage of sin or the pain that I am experiencing or whatever the case might be, you see, in division, we lose the simplicity of the gospel message. We make it about ourselves or about others when it's always about Jesus. Paul then goes on to say in chapter 2 and verse 1, your attention please, it says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. In other words, Paul is saying, when I came to you, and what we read about Paul coming to the believers at Corinth, remember that, that at this point, Paul, when he came to Corinth, he came after being beaten imprisoned. And remember, he didn't have a good run in Philippi, nor in Thessalonica, not even in Berea. And remember, he was scoffed at in Athens. By this time, Paul came to the believers at Corinth, and in Acts chapter 18 and verse 1, we've seen that Paul perhaps had a different method of how to reach. You see, Paul did things differently. As a matter of fact, it was Paul who said, I become all things to all men, right? And what, was, what did that mean? That means that if he was in an area or a certain group of philosophers, then he would preach the gospel from that perspective. But if he was with the lowly, perhaps, or those who were not as lofty in their words, Paul then would preach the gospel from that perspective. I become all things to all men. And what is his initial intent and purpose in that statement? For the purpose of the cross of Christ. All things to all men. And this is what Paul is reminding them of. It's always good for us to look back and say, how did we get here? How did we get to where we are today? And where are you today? You're born again. You've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. You're, you're a Christian. There's only one way that that works. And you have to trace that origin back to a work that you didn't do, the work of the cross. I think at times it's very humbling when we realize that you didn't get you to where you are today. But sometimes we think we did. Oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a student of the word. And uh, I, I, I got here because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm good at the word. But keep in mind that it's important for us to understand that we can lose sight that it's only by God's grace and his grace alone that we are where we are. It's only by God's grace alone that we are where we are. And it's always good to look back to the cross. And this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, remember, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellence of speech or wisdom. So this is a little bit different than all the other times. Remember that Paul's initial method is he would go into the synagogues. He would preach, right? He would go. He had a desire to minister to he had a desire to minister to the Jews. I mean, that's what he really had a burden for, right? But it would seem more and more that God used him to reach Gentiles. You see, Peter, the apostle, he was used quite a bit to minister to the Jews. It seemed like the two covered, really, the whole of humanity, Jews and Gentiles. But Paul says, when I came to you, I came a little bit different. I'd already been imprisoned for the sake of the gospel. I've been beaten. Things happened to me in various cities. And now he comes to the people at Corinth and he, and he connected with a couple. So he did things a little bit different. Rather than going to a synagogue, he, he connected with a couple, Aquila and Priscilla, and they were, they were tent makers. And this is the only time that we hear of Paul actually, you know, laboring with his own hands. As a matter of fact, even in the letter to the Corinthians, he he tells them, you know, I, I didn't take money from you because I never wanted to be accused of, of doing this for money. But he was a tent maker. So he did what he had to do to get by to minister the word of God. What point should we jot down? Paul points to himself and his humble beginnings at Corinth. And I think that's a good, good perspective to have. Where did the Lord find you? And how did he find you? Well, he says here, I didn't come with excellence of speech, not as a philosopher 
or of wisdom declaring to you, listen to this, the testimony. The word here for testimony means, but a witness of God. You know, sometimes we have to try different methods in reaching people. You know, sometimes you don't want to come both barrels loaded and Bible thumping, right? <laughs> that doesn't always work. Sometimes it does. You, sometimes it does. It can get there, but it doesn't always do that. It does not always do that. And so keep in mind that we have to, at times, you know, use different methods or tactics. It's important. Um, sometimes I will assess a situation when people say, oh, you know, you know, pastor, we invite you, you know, to, to you know, to, to come to our house. We're going to invite our unsafe family members. And I think that's great. But the next question I ask is, what are we going to eat? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I always try to make this appeal and I say, listen, me being at your house and and you and your, you know, unsafe family members, you know, they, they might not get, become born again. OK, if, you know, because the power is not in Pastor Dave. I will power down the food you put in front of me. But. But the power is not in Pastor Dave. The power is in the work and ministry and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. That I have no problem going and, and eating a good meal and, you know, and you know, all we're doing is setting them up, man, you know. But, but I assess the situation. I tell them, tell me a little bit about them. Oh, well, you know, and it, you know, it all depends. If they say, you know, they're, they're very smart, they're intelligent, they're this, they're that, they're, you know, all this. Then I start to think like, oh, man, okay. I got to like come up with some good stuff, right? I start praying, Lord, give me words because I'm not very eloquent in speech. But, but God, I know that, I know that you, can, you can work it all out. Or they'll say, oh, you know, they just lived a really rough life and they're really, you know, just, just a hard person. I said, oh, that's my kind of people. I'll be all right there. It's, you know, I still pray, don't get me wrong, but it's a little bit more easy to relate to them, right? Uh, you know, the uglier they look, the better off I am. But anyways... There's always prayer going forth as to the circuit. I ask because I want to try to be able to relate in some way. It doesn't matter whether they are intellectuals or been in prison most of their life. In the course of whatever method I use, there's one underlining thing that I cannot get away from. And it's going to be the same on each end. The gospel. The gospel. There's no way to change it. It is what it is. It's the gospel. It's the power of God. But how I arrive there is where the Spirit gives me wisdom. How I kind of take it there is how the Spirit gives me wisdom. I'll never forget one time, you know, dear friends of mine invited me over to their house and they wanted me to minister to their to their loved one who was like, you know, a, a physician or something like that. And I'm just kind of like, oh, OK, you know, and not to like turn them off. You know, I wore a long sleeve shirt so they wouldn't see my tattoos and be like, oh, it's probably one of those, you know, one of those cholo pastors or whatever. But anyways, um, you know, I went over there and yeah, I did. You know, I sat there and, you know, talked with them. And, and you know what? We didn't talk about the gospel at all. I just was like asking them questions and I got like really and I wanted to hear more and listen to them the whole time. Like, oh, wow. Yeah, they taught you that, you know, and I didn't even know what I was talking about. But anyways, at the end of it all, when it was all said and done. You know, after they were just like, yeah, we were kind of hoping, you know, that it was that awkward moment after their, you know, their loved one left and then we're there after, you know, and I'm like, hey, you want me to help with the dishes? I knew they were going to say no, but I just thought I'd ask because <laughs> anyways. <laughs> And then they were just like, no. And then they're just like, wow, I thought like, you were going to get in the word. And, and I was like, yeah, you know, you know, it just, I think the Lord's going to do something, you know. And, and, and at the end of the day, it just seemed like they weren't happy with me. And I thought, man, I'm not going to get invited here no more. And this, this is really good food, man, you know. And <laughs> I really blew this one, you know. And the next thing, like a couple of days later, a week later or something, they call me and they say, Pastor David, they were all excited, you know. You'll never believe what happened. They, you know, their, their loved one, want, they didn't come to our church, but they said, their loved one said, hey, I want to go to church with you guys. 
He just called them out of the blue. Are you going to church this Sunday? Yeah, I want to go to church with you. And they were shocked. And they said, why? He says, because, you know, that, that young man you guys brought, that, the pastor, you know, I thought I was going to get Bible thumped. But as he sat and listened and was more concerned about me and my life and what I was doing and just the little things he said, I seen a peace and a joy and a patience with me that I've never seen in my life. And he says, and I want what he has. You know, so then I was like, all right, that was the meal plus fourteen ninety nine ninety nine. You know, I said, <laughs> I says, you know, I says, you see, that's that's God has a way of doing it. You know, when we go over there and we're like, we're going to get them. Because some of you, you know how you are. You know how you do like, Pastor, come over here. And they don't, you give me like the whole, you tell me all their cheese, man. You know, it's like, and you know, and he did this and he did that and that. It's like, I ain't trying to hear that, man. Then I'm all distracted looking at him like, you sick dog, man. No, you know, it's like the gospel goes out of my mind, everything. You know, it's like, <laughs> you, you, don't do that, man. Rely on the Holy Spirit. But, but this is the point that Paul is making here. He's saying, Listen, when I came to you, I, I didn't come in any way trying to manipulate the situation. I came being led by the Spirit of God. And listen, in other places, Paul wouldn't stay there for long periods of time. As a matter of fact, he would move on very quickly. But Paul says, I didn't come to you as a philosopher. So how did he come to the Corinthians? He came to them as a man who had been imprisoned already, beaten, thrown out of cities, right? And, and, and even discouraged by the Athenian philosophers, right? Remember that? He was very discouraged. So he came discouraged. He came, in a sense, timid, afraid, right? And he came very humble. And what was it about Paul that opened the door for these believers at Corinth to hear the gospel at the right time, the right way? It was all a work of the Spirit. He goes on to say that he came declaring the wisdom to you, the testimony of God, for I, listen to this, determined. For I determined to know, to not know anything among you, listen to this, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul says, I came as an ambassador, not as a salesman. I came as one who truly had a desire to minister because this is what I was called to. Not to bring a sales pitch or manipulate the circumstance or the situation, but truly in work of the Spirit. For I determined not to know anything among you. In other words, his desire was simply to point them to Jesus. To simply point them to Jesus. And I think that when you look at this and you see what he's speaking about here, this should always be what we desire to do. In all conversation, we should be pointing people to Jesus. Whenever we declare the truth of God, we should be pointing people to Jesus. In everything that we say, we should be pointing people to Christ or the cross. Of Christ. Simply declaring the truth of God's word. Simply making known the truth of God's word. That's what it's about. He says, I determined to not know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. See, Paul taught and expounded what is known as the, the whole counsel of God. It's one of those reminders that, that he declared in his ministry about sharing the word of God. He said it in his own, that he was very confident of this very thing among the believers, to declare the fullness of God's word. And he says it. In Acts chapter 20, he said this, in verse 27. He says, For I have not shunned to de declare to you the whole counsel of God. I have not declared to shun to you the whole counsel of God. And one of the things that I think is important is that 
people say, well, what was the whole counsel of God? Keep in mind that, that Paul the Apostle did not have the New Testament yet. The New Testament was still being lived out and practiced. But everything that he preached was from the Old Testament. There's so much in the Old Testament scriptures that declare the purpose and plan and truth of God. It talks about the Messiah. So what Paul did was he declared the truth of what God's word declared in the Old Testament, but then also said all of this has now been fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And he made the connection. Paul made the connection with those who heard very clearly what the Old Testament said and he made the connection in who Christ is. The important thing that we need to understand is that Paul also ministered unto them the very word of God. He never gave them anything else. In Acts chapter 18 and verse 11, Paul labored on the counsel of God and in the word of God to those there at Corinth. Paul was there for, as we stated in one of our studies, for about a, a year and a half ministering among them. But notice what he goes on to say as well that I think is important for us to take note of here. He says, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. This is where we get a better understanding as to how we come. You know, Paul says there was much going on. And he makes it very clear. And his whole desire was to, in a sense, compare his life to Christ and him crucified. What does this look like? Sacrifice. And it's interesting because when one doesn't understand the sacrifice or the crucifixion, when one doesn't understand these things that take place, and in a sense, it brings us to an understanding until a person understands the gospel there's nothing more to really say to them. Because in a sense, it's true that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Until one comes to what it is, then we really have anything, nothing else to say. You leave it there. Let it sit for a while. You know, sometimes that has been the case, right? Where you, you share the gospel with someone. They might not respond right away, but... But they might come to you later and say, hey, you know that stuff you were saying about, you know, Jesus? Yeah. Hey, he died on the cross for our, our sins. Oh, yeah, you were listening, huh? He says, yeah, I want to know a little bit more about that. I think what Paul is walking them through is reminding them of how simple it was when they realized they had a need and Jesus was the answer. Sometimes our walk needs to simply just get back to that. You know, sometimes I have to just get back to that. I can get lost in what God has done with the ministry at Living Way and other things that I'm involved in in the ministry and, and the lives that have been impacted throughout the years. Humbled deeply. But there's a potential to be distracted as well. Always going back to the simplicity of how things were is really good. It brings us to a place where we say, God, I have nothing else to offer, but, but all of me, not part of me. I was with you in weakness, in fear and in much trembling. In weakness, the idea here, some would say in sickness. We talked a little bit about this on on Sunday night in the topic of suffering, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and this whole picture of, of Paul talking about, you know, this messenger of Satan to buffet him. And, you know, there's been various interpretations as to exactly what the text means. And Paul came with this. And I think the weakness in this case, had to do more with the realization that Paul, in a sense, realized that there was nothing that he can do in his own strength. That he had to truly trust in the Lord. You know, that's what trials do. They, they weaken us. 
They, they get our attention. They, for a moment, they, they, they can get us back on track. They're, they're motivators that God uses to, to get us back on. And in the case of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that's kind of always been my take on it. Some would say it was, it was, a, it was a physical infirmity. And, and I believe that when it says a messenger of Satan, the word there for messenger is, is used over a hundred times in the New Testament to refer to an angel. Perhaps demonic oppression was coming upon Paul. To buffet me, the word buffet clearly has to do in the New Testament with someone doing wrong to someone else. It's that whole mindset that Paul, remember, when he was talking about all the things that he endured as a believer, remember all the things that he had suffered uh, in, in his ministry. And, and, and not so that people could feel sorry for him, but, but listen to what Paul says. And I think this is interesting. Paul goes on to say this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? Verse 22, so am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measures. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I had been in the deep. In journeys, often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil. Boy, imagine if the Lord says, hey, I'm going to use you. But these are the things that I'm going to use in you and for you. In weariness of toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. Is that a lot? Anybody here want to go through that? Didn't think so. Now listen, when the Lord called Paul... You know, on his Damascus Road experience, it, the Lord left this out. He didn't tell him, hey, these are all the things you're going to experience. These are, these are the things that, as Paul's looking back and reflecting on his life, he's saying, these are all the things that I've experienced, all the things that I have went through as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. Sleeplessness. Look at all these things that he's saying here. And then in verse 28, he says, besides the other things, which comes upon me daily. Listen to this. So there's more. Is there more? I mean, what's worse? What's worse than being left for dead? What's worse than than being thrown in prison more frequently in deaths often? I mean, what can get worse than that? Besides other things, what comes upon me daily. Listen to this. My deep concern for all the churches. It seems here that that Paul is saying in verse 28 that it's not only outward that he suffered great physical persecution. But Paul says here, but inward also. It was also emotional. There were times that he was going through suffering emotionally. And I believe this is what 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is about. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, knowing that there were those that were desiring to disrupt and destroy the church and And all he could do was pray because there was nothing he personally can do other than speak the truth of God's word and trust that God would work on his behalf and the spirit would move upon the hearts of those he loved so deeply. You see, listen, guys, we never truly understand spiritual warfare until we're in the midst of it. You know that most of spiritual warfare is is not done in, in the physical flesh. It's done 
in prayer and in intercession. There is opposition coming toward you. There's so much taking place and all you can do is speak the truth of God's word, declare it and proclaim it, trust in it and believe that the spirit will demonstrate through it. That's what warfare is. It's why Paul said we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not a flesh and blood thing. It's a spiritual thing. In weakness, sometimes we feel fatigued in ministry. Sometimes one spiritual battle, battle excuse me, after the other can sometimes weaken us. But, but the Bible does give us hope that, that in our weakness, he is made strong. So we can be encouraged and strengthened. Nobody likes spiritual warfare and nobody will sign up for like, give me this spiritual warfare side of it all. No. But it will come. But warfare is when you can sense the work of the enemy and there's nothing you can do but pray. That's the only way we get an upper hand or gain in some way some type of ground and take back what the enemy is trying to discourage or rip from our lives. And listen, sometimes the Lord uses that to, to draw us closer. It's a little bit of what we were ministering on Sunday night, that the Lord will use that sometimes to draw us closer to him. And, and know that that's at times how the Lord works. But Paul says, I came to you and I was with you in weakness. In fear and in trembling. Well, also in humility. We see that in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5 and, and Philippians chapter 2 and verse, verse 12. But, but he talks about being with them. And, you know, oftentimes there is that element of humility that we must demonstrate so that the work of God can go forth. It should never be in our own power, in our own strength, but it should always be in demonstration of the Spirit. Look at what the Bible says. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. Humility is key. It's the very thing that binds us to the very heart of God, the purpose and the plan of God and the will of God for our lives. It's an important truth. He goes on to say, therefore, in verse 12 of Philippians 2, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, listen to this, but, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. To work out one's own salvation, it doesn't mean that we work for our salvation. It's saying live it out with reverence and obedience unto God, humility. For it is God who works in you. So it's not a work that you do, but it's God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It's not always a pleasure for us, but it's for his good pleasure. We also see, as we read in 2 Corinthians 11, in persecution. It's a great reminder. Also in Acts chapter 16, in verses 22 and 24, jot it down for your own personal read. Acts chapter 17, in verse 10, 13 and 14 as well. In verse 32 of Acts 17. So much that Paul had experienced the persecution even leading up to this point. And he says in verse 4, And my speech and my preaching, listen to this, were not with persuasive words. They were not with impressive words. This was the point he's making in his second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 10 and verse 10. Not with these eloquent, persuasive words, because that's not what it's about. Listen, and, and when we share the word of God, we keep it simple. 
Nothing wrong with that. He goes on to say this to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 10. He says, for his letters, they are, they are weighty and powerful. But his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. Notice what he's saying here. As you, you listen to the words, as, as Paul is saying, you, know, you get these letters and you look at them and you say, wow, this is power. But then you see him and you're like, that, that's the guy? <laughs> you know, ultimately, he's giving him a contrast and saying, this is how the Lord uses us. And at times, it's not really impressive. But he goes on to say here, with, it wasn't with persuasive words. Of human wisdom, once again, he goes back on the topic of human wisdom again. And I believe he's continuing this on. But he goes on to say this, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Now, I want us to stop there. I was getting here because I want to lay something out. What he's saying is, Paul is saying, it's my job to preach. And it's the spirit's job to demonstrate. It's my job to declare the truth of God's word and the Spirit's job to demonstrate. So, you know, I remember years ago, and, and I often say this a lot because it's always a reminder. I'll never forget one time hearing this guy preach, and this was before, this was years ago. This was probably some, I don't know, 18 years ago. And, and I'll never forget, I heard him say, I want to preach with conviction. You know, and I remember when I heard that, I thought, oh yeah, he wants, he wants to see a response after he's done teaching. But then I thought to myself, Lord, may I never, ever get to the point where I feel that there needs to be a response of numbers, even if it's just one person, that's really all that matters. But even more so, shouldn't your word affect my heart and do a work in me before I even declare it to others? And I love what he's saying here, because when we preach and allow the Spirit to demonstrate there's greater fruit that comes out of it. You know, sometimes after I teach a study here, and I've shared this before with you guys, and I drive home, I'm like, man, that was a horrible study. And sometimes I don't even like what I said, so I'll, I'll go back on and I'll listen to it. I'm like, why did I say that? I was like dumb. You know, it's like, or somebody will, they'll, they'll, they'll text me or they'll, uh, direct message or messenger and they'll say, you know, when you said that, 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 this and that, and then I'll be honest, I'll text them back. I said that when? Because that sounds pretty good, man, you know, but anyways. <laughs> but sometimes I just get so overwhelmed where it's just, it's just, you know, that was a horrible study. I could have did better there. But then either later on that night or the next day, somebody will say, that message ministered to me. And this is what I was, and I don't tell them what I was thinking. You know, I'm just like, yeah, it's just, okay, Lord, you saved that. Because we should never try to manufacture a work of the Holy Spirit. What is the purpose and the need of the Holy Spirit? As I was, I was contemplating this thought here, I wrote down a couple of things on this piece of paper and I said, well, you know, here's, people always ask me, where's my notes? Here you go, you can have it after. So Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27 came to mind and it says the spirit of man is, is the lamp of the Lord. And I was thinking about that. I says, Lord, may I be the Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27 individual. May the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit truly be the lamp of the Lord as you direct it where it would shine. May it not be my words or my eloquence. May it not be or whatever it is that I feel that I have to offer. But may it simply be a demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And may it be that very thing that Jesus often said about the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. I think sometimes we forget about the emphasis that Jesus made. In, in John chapter 14, in verse, in verse 16, Jesus says, I pray to the Father and he will, he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The forever abidance of the Holy Spirit, another helper, another, the original language, the word means another just like me. So the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit should look like Jesus. The problem is, we've made the Holy Spirit look like somebody totally different. 
So who's a liar? I know it's not Jesus. And I know it's not the word of God. Didn't you see how careful Paul was to the believers at Corinth to say, it's about Christ and him crucified. Oh, but, but I got issues with the followers of Cephas. Now, you know what they were doing? They were telling us that Apollos was a better speaker. You know, well, well, well you know what? Well, well, we just, we follow Jesus Christ. Well, we follow Paul. He's the one that founded the church. Paul's like, forget all of that. We're missing the bigger picture here. Christ isn't divided. I didn't die for you. None of us did. It's about the message of the cross. And if, we, and if we begin to emphasize things other than the simplicity of what Jesus has declared in his word and demonstrated with his own self, then we miss the bigger picture as to why we're even here and why we even... This is why so many Christians struggle. They're in one moment, they're out. They're in, they're out. How do you remain consistent He goes on to say this, verse 26 of John chapter 15, Jesus says, but when the helper, the Holy Spirit comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, listen to this, he will testify of me. Do you believe that tonight? Do, do you guys believe what Jesus says? Okay, so the Spirit testifies of who? Does he testify of himself? Does he testify of anything else? Of Jesus and that alone. So when you start to say that's a work of the Spirit, you better make sure that it represents the ministry of Jesus Christ that we see in the Gospels. Because that's the Holy Spirit's job. Not to draw attention to himself, but to point us to Jesus. How about this one? John chapter 16, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, listen to this, he will guide you into all truth. You ready? For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you the things to come. Listen to this. You ready? He will glorify God. Me. For he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. You guys know that we have enough in the New Testament, in the Gospels, to study the life of Jesus from now until Christ comes back. You will never exhaust the Gospels in your lifetime. You know that, right? You believe that? Okay, so instead of trying to figure out what new trick the Holy Spirit is up to nowadays, study the life of Christ. And you won't be like the Corinthians who say, I am of Apollos. I am of Paul. I am of Cephas. Oh, I am of Jesus Christ. Truly, what is the whole purpose and work and ministry of the Holy Spirit? Look, it gets even better, guys. Check this out. I, I love this here. As I was reading this, I was getting excited. I know you guys aren't, but I am, okay? That's the main thing, that I'm excited. But I had to ask the Lord to forgive me. I know you're shocked right now, okay? I know you think I walk on water and all that. You know, it's okay, that's fine. But I had to ask the Lord to forgive me. I says, God, forgive me for... We're messing this up. For thinking I needed to add to your word, perhaps, my wisdom. As if I had something to offer and, and ultimately there's nothing I have to offer other than what the Spirit has revealed to me. So my sole purpose should be, as well as all of ours, is to do the will of God. 1 John chapter 2, verse 17 says, He who does the will of God lives forever. How many of you guys want to live forever? Well, do the will of God. <laughs> I just love how simple, you know, you read these verses and it's like they hit you and you're like, wow, that's I, okay. I see what you're saying, Lord. And you say, well, how do I do God's will? It's very simple. 
I was looking for this verse and it was driving me crazy. I says, Lord, reveal to me what, what excites me the most. And you know what, guys? In all the years that I've been walking with the Lord now and, in, uh, you know, 19 years in the church, 20 years, but faithfully walking with the Lord, 19 years without no mess up, nothing straight. I look and I say, God, what is it? What has sustained me? And it truly has been the word of God. It's been reading the word of God daily and not just reading it and amassing knowledge. Because there's a lot of people that are very knowledgeable in the word, but they're very shallow in obedience. They have nothing to offer me and nothing to offer the body of Christ for that matter. But there might be people that are shallow in the word, but deep in obedience. I'll follow that person. Because obedience to just the smallest part of God's word pays high dividends. I know that to be true because God is faithful at his word. And what is it? It's the word of God. I, I, I truly appreciate uh, what Paul writes to the believers at Thessalonica. In 2 Thessalonians, and I want to read this to you guys. I, I think you'll appreciate this. I, I've shared this before not too long ago here in the church, but, but I want to share it again with you guys. Excuse me, 1 Thessalonians. And I just have this one word circled here, just one word circled here. It's found in chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And in this whole entire two pages here in my Bible, I just got one word circled here. And I knew it was there in my Bible. I just, I just, I just had to look for it. And it says this. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because you receive the word of God, which you heard from us. You welcomed it. Not as the word of men. But as it is, in truth, the word of God, which also, listen to this, effectively works in you who believe. Now listen to this. He says the word of God, which is the truth of God, the word of God, he says, which also effectively works in you who believe. You see that word works? It is the Greek word that means to energize. God's word energizes you. It gets you excited. You ever been reading the word of God and then this revelation comes to you and you're just like, I, all of a sudden you're like, you wake up, anybody? Okay, and you're like, oh, I gotta call somebody. I mean, I've done that before. I don't care what time it is, man. I've texted them, hey, are you up? And then I don't even give them a chance to respond. So I just call them. You know, it's like, hey, man, check this out. You need to get in the word and check this out. They're like, I'm asleep. I don't care. Open up your Bible right now. You're a Christian, right? Open up your word, man. <laughs> but, but you see, the point here is that this is what God's word has done for us. It motivates us. It energizes us. It gives us what we need to continue to move forward. And this is why Paul says, listen, all my job is to preach the gospel. It's the spirit's job to demonstrate and I love this picture. Why? Because we can truly understand and know that the word of God is power. There's no doubt about that. The word of God is power. And it works. And as Isaiah said, it doesn't return void unto him. It fulfills and accomplishes its purpose. And you can rest assured. That as long as we preach word, I love what Jesus said. Remember, he says, the words that I speak, listen to this, they are spirit and they are life. The words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. You know, some people say, you know, we want a work of the spirit. And don't worry, I'm going to get into the gifts of the Holy Spirit when we get into chapter 12, 13 and 14. And we're going to really break that down. But right here, you know, some people say, I just want a work of the Holy Spirit. You know what they're saying? You know what they're saying? They want some emotional experience to happen in the church service. They're waiting and looking for the goosebumps. Oh, I felt it. It was heavy in there today. What was heavy? The food you ate before you came to church? 
If you diminish the word of God to some emotional experience, then you miss the essence of what the purpose of God's word is for. And that is to work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It is to energize you. And you want to know what? It hinders you from growing and knowing the Lord as what he says in his word. It takes away from the spirit delivering unto you that which he receives from Christ. That's what Jesus said he would do. Listen to this. Jesus says the words that I speak are spirit and they are. Do you believe that the words he speaks are spirit in life? Do you believe it? Yes or no? OK, so the spirit of God is at work when the word of God is being taught. There's a work of the Holy Spirit. And see, we don't think the spirit's working. Why? What? Think about it. We don't think the spirit's at work. Why? What are we looking for? It blows my mind that we don't take the gospel of Christ, the word of God, and say, this is it right here. If we were to just believe what the scriptures say, your walk for the kingdom would be way different. Literally, it would be way different. Lord, this is spirit in life. Absolutely. The Bible says it's living. It's powerful. Hebrews 4, 12. It's the word of God. He goes on to say here, and as he's reminding them about this demonstration of the spirit, he says, and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man. And what is the wisdom of man? Man's manufacturing. But in the power of God. Not in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Where is the power of God? Was it, was it in the wisdom of Apollos or the wisdom of Paul or the wisdom of Cephas or the prideful wisdom of the followers of Christ? No. The power of God is in the message that God has declared. And it's not just a message that he spoke. It was a message that was not only spoken, but demonstrated. It was a message demonstrated in the person and work of his son, Jesus Christ. So he's saying here, but in the power of God, a pure work of God by his spirit, a pure work of God by his spirit. I think it's important for us to understand that God still moves and operates in this dynamic. And if you want it, it's there for you. And the other stuff will always be there. It will always be there. I can assure you of that. I know. OK, I, I, I know. I, you know, and. We have to be very careful that we don't get caught up in some new light or some new theology or some new. Listen, everything that we need is here in the word of God. Now, granted that, yeah, when you read the word, God speaks to us and his word, because it's alive, it will always affect you, even if you read the same verse a hundred times. Why? Not because there's mysteries and unlocking codes and, you know, it could have 20 different meanings, right? No, because it's alive. It's not dead, man. You don't have to create different interpretations. It's alive. The spirit of God is at work. Listen, you, you say you believe it, right? That it is. Well, this is why the word of God is so powerful. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of man. I just I just love this picture here. Because if you can be brought in. By human influence or the wisdom of man. Then you can be brought out. By that wisdom of man and knowledge also. You can easily be taken out by that. If you were brought in by man's wisdom, you can be taken out by man. So you see, here's what I'll tell you guys is. A lot of people come and they say, and I don't deny people's experience. They're just like, you know, and I was, and I was in there and I was, and I was, I'm like, cool, man. If that day, that's your thing. Yeah. Hey, get down. You're more emotional than me. That's fine. I get it. You know, Mexicans were like that. We're all about that emotion, man. You know, it's like, that was my song in there. They sang my song, you know, and that's like, it's like, that don't make no sense. <laughs> 
But that's okay. If that's what the Lord uses, your song, then go ahead, you know. But, but if I talk to you 15 years later, I shouldn't see you like, I'm still listening to my song and listening to my, you know, listen. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> But you guys know what I'm talking about. It's the wisdom of man. Now, let me help you with this because we need to grow. We need to go on to maturity. We need to see the very truth of what God's word is. It's an interesting dynamic, guys. That, listen, I know that you, you know, some people come to churches for various reasons. Some people go to churches because the pastors preach sermonettes. You know, sermonettes. 20, 30 minute sermons. <laughs> That's like you making a slab of ribs and giving me like the rib tip or something like here. That's for you, Pastor Dave. <laughs> the Lord rebuke you, man. <laughs> to ever do that to me. Give me half a slab and we'll be all right. Anyways, no, listen, sermonettes are for Christianettes. You know, it's like the people saying they go to church because of the size of the building or all the glitz and glamour. Now, listen, I, I, you know, if God, you know, gives us something bigger than this, so be it. I mean, we're at the point that we need something bigger than this. But, but that's not why I'm still here. I've been offered churches bigger than this. Some of you know. Some of you know. <laughs> A church way bigger than this. Beautiful place in a very affluent area. I would have been doing very well right now. <sighs> but anyways, God called me to Montana. <laughs> oh, I would have been doing really good right now. But I know where God called me. And I know where I would be the most effective. You know what I would have been over there? I would have been a hireling. I would have been a paid shepherd. Not a shepherd who I was never called to that place. Some people go for that. Some people go because of the worship. Oh, you know, I feel I'm, I'm feeling the worship. Well, I, I'm sorry. You know, or I don't feel the worship there. You're not supposed to. We're not worshiping you. So who cares if you feel it or don't feel it? We worship God. It's never about you. It's about him. We worship the Lord God. The attention should always be Jesus. I'll tell you what, that worship leader that's up here leading worship is worshiping the Lord. They're not worshiping you. They're worshiping God. They're in their space with the Lord and they're inviting you to come into their worship set as they worship their King, their Lord and their Savior. And what greater joy is it is when we are led in worship by those who love God with all of their heart. It doesn't matter if you feel it or don't feel it. You know, keep in mind, guys, that this could never be about us. If, it's, if we're brought in by the wisdom of man, the tactics of man, the methods of man, the ways of man. Listen, anything will take you out. But when you're brought in by the word of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, boy, nothing can shake you. Nothing can move you. Because there's substance, there's foundation. You're standing on something strong and people are like, what's wrong with you? Like, Nothing. I'm good. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. My prayer tonight is that our faith would be in the power of God. That our faith would be in who Jesus is. Amen. Hey, guys, listen, here's what I will tell you. Uh, one thing that that living way that we do here as a church and that I've always said, Lord, this is what I will always do until you come back. And that is to teach the word of God chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And for those of you that have been here since I responded to the call in 2008 to be the senior pastor of this church, I have not failed one bit service after service in and out to declare the truth of God's word, regardless of what takes place or happens. Because I know that's the only thing that can help you. I can't help you. I will send you to hell if you have your eyes on me. I will lead you astray because I'm only human. But the one thing that does help is the word of God. And it will radically transform your life. And no matter what comes your way, 
you will stand strong. And the days that we're living in today, you need to be lovers of God's word, obedient to it, resting in it, trusting in it, and not distracted by anyone or anything else. The power of the gospel. And to see people still get saved and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is the most rewarding thing in ministry. Not the bank account of this church. Not the lack of debt in this church. Not the things that we have. The greatest thing that I enjoy the most is seeing men and women come to faith in Christ Jesus. That blesses my heart more than anything. Even if it's just one soul at a time. It's not about hype. It's not about anything else other than they've came encountered with the living God. And the word of God has captivated their heart. And it's the word of God that is working in them and doing that great work.